a black ATF agent accuses Biden's director nominee of racism, and a history of gun carry in America with Professor David Yamani. That and more on this episode of the Weekly Reload Podcast. I made the devil run. I gave him poison just for fun. All right, we're back with another episode of the Weekly Reload Podcast. I'm your host, Stephen Gatowski. I'm also the founder of TheReload.com. And before we start, actually, let me give you a little bit of a plug here for The Reload. Uh, if you go over to TheReload.com and you buy a membership, you will actually get this podcast an entire day early. So make sure you head over there and check out some of the options we have. I just brought back the co-founders membership, uh, which allows people to provide a bit more support for the site to keep it going, to make it sustainable in the long run. We've been here about four months now, um, and we're, we're going well, but we've got a ways to go to get to uh, you know full sustainability and then growth from there so we can cover more uh, topics every day. But you know, without support of the members, this publication, this podcast would not exist, and you wouldn't get stories like the one we're going to talk about first here today that we broke this week uh, of a black ATF agent, a former agent, who accused Biden's ATF director nominee, David Chipman, of falsely alleging that he had cheated on a promotion assessment back in uh, 2007. And the agent claimed that the allegation led to a uh, several-year-long Office of Inspector General investigation over at the Department of Justice, which eventually cleared his name but sidelined his career during that time period uh, and effectively sort of uh, stunted it, even though he was eventually cleared, the agent says. Uh, And he uh, believes that Chipman did this uh, out of a racial animus towards him as a black agent. So, uh, you know, that that's the allegation. That's what the agent is saying. Um, It's uh, obviously we have not confirmed we can't confirm that he what Chipman's state of mind was. However, uh, there was a second agent who corroborated the uh, claim that this investigation was undertaken at the time. Uh, he, the second agent, said uh, that he had been told when this happened by the first agent uh, that there was an investigation uh, going to happen because of the allegations that he had cheated on a promotion assessment. Uh, and additionally, the Department of Justice itself did confirm that David Chipman accused an agent in 2007 of cheating on an assessment, and then that accusation led to an OIG, Office of Inspector General, investigation into the incident. However, they didn't release any further details because the report from OIG is still confidential, um, and they would not release that report to the reload uh, either. They did defend Chipman against uh, the allegation that he acted on racial uh, a racial bias. Uh, they said they referred to a previous story um, where Chipman had a complaint filed against him in the Equal Employment Opportunity Office within the department uh, and that Chipman had been um, cleared of those Complaints that complaint centered around uh, really a very similar story uh, to this one, where while Shipman was in Detroit in the same year, actually in 2007, um, he was alleged to have made comments that uh, black too many black agents had passed an ass- assessment for promotion and that they must have cheated. Uh, apparently. Uh, the accusation is that a black agent heard that and was upset with those comments and filed uh, a complaint against him. Um, Shipman has not reacted to either one of these complaints uh, other than to say that the the equal employment opportunity complaints filed against him were resolved without any sort of, uh, you know, a punishment or a reprimand for him. So uh, the White House also has not reacted in any way to either one of these stories. Uh, and Dick Durbin, the the chairman of the Senate Judiciary Committee, where, where Chipman's nomination um, remains at at this point after a tie vote back in uh, June, um, he has not <laughs> agreed to a second hearing, which is what Republicans want um, based off of these new allegations that are coming out. 
uh, about Chipman and instead has essentially argued that uh, the sources behind these stories are in fact made up um, essentially saying that, that the the reload is an anti-gun safety publication which is a bizarre um, <laughs> description of course I, I am literally a gun safety uh, certified instructor but uh, regardless Dick Durbin says that these stories are are made up essentially and uh, that he will not grant a second hearing to uh, get at, even though there's obviously no dispute over the existence of both the EEOC complaints or this uh, OIG report on uh, the allegation uh, against the black former agents made by Chipman. So right now, Senator Grassley from Iowa, the ranking member, the ranking Republican on the committee is asking the Department of Justice uh, Office of Inspector General itself directly to release the report to his office. He has also said that his office has received um, co you know, cooperating whistleblower reports independent of the Reload's reporting on this incident. So there, there has been more information that the Senator's office has received than what apparently has been, you know, reported at the Reload. So We'll continue to follow that story, of course, uh, as things unfold there. And we'll see what the Inspector General says in response to the Senator's letter and how things unfold from here, uh, where you won't see this covered and who will not be continuing to follow this, it seems at least, uh, are the mainstream outlets that exist. Fox News has picked up this story and a number of conservative outlets have covered it as well, bearing arms. Uh, town hall, for example, but nobody at any of the other major outlets, including you know ABC, CBS, NBC, CNN, MSNBC, uh, the Washington Post, New York Times, none of them have even mentioned the allegations, uh, the the latest allegation against Chipman from a, a black former ATF agent, uh, even in passing in any of their stories. So again, without the reload, this story would never likely have seen the light of day, uh, which is exactly why I encourage you all to buy a subscription uh, if you have not already to keep us uh, going here. We are 100% reader funded. Uh, there's no funding from anyone else beyond the those who decide to join the reload. Uh, and. If you do join, you will get my uh, extended thoughts on why it is that there has been silence on this particular story within the media uh, and why I don't think that that would have been the case if Chipman was a Trump or Bush nominee. Um, I know that that is a common criticism that you hear from people on the right of media, and I think oftentimes it's made in bad faith. Uh, but that doesn't mean the media is beyond reproach. And I think in this situation, it's hard to understand any reasonable explanation for why an allegation by a, a direct allegation by a black former agent against the director nominee who's, who's up to head one of the, you know, uh, biggest federal law enforcement agencies in existence, uh, has not received any coverage, even though, the Department of Justice itself has confirmed parts or details of this story. So it's very difficult to understand that. Uh, perhaps there will be more coverage coming down the line. We'll see. I'm not holding my breath as of this point, but if you go to the reload and you join, you will get my analysis on why this is happening, why other major outlets are not covering this story. Um, but. With that aside, there's been obviously, we've talked a lot about Chipman in the last couple episodes. It's it's one of the biggest things happening right now in guns, but uh, it's not the only thing going on. And, and so I wanted to have someone on this week to uh, talk about his book um, that he put out. It's a very short book, uh, but it's very concise and very informative, I think, uh, called Concealed Carry Revolution. And it's uh, David Yamani. Uh, uh, he's a professor uh, who's written extensively on the topic. I have his book here if you want to 
take a look. Um, he's a professor of sociology at Wake Forest University, and he's one of the top names, I think, in uh, the academic world when it comes to studying guns uh, outside of the criminal use of firearms, which is fairly rare. So I, I thought he would be a good guest to bring on, and I think he gives quite a lot of insight in, the, in our interview. So make sure you uh, stay tuned here. We're going to head over there now to hear from David. So take it away, me, in the future. All right, we're here with uh, David Yamani of Wake Forest University. He's a professor of sociology over there. David, why don't you give us uh, a little introduction for anyone who might not have uh, heard of you before who's listening to the podcast? Sure. Well, uh, thank you so much for having me on the podcast, for one. I think it's a great initiative, and I love what you're doing with uh, the Reload, and I'm happy to be a supporter of that uh, myself. Uh, I'm, as you said, a professor of sociology at Wake Forest University. I have been a gun owner for about 10 years, and for that same period of time, I've also been studying American gun culture. So started with a fairly discreet uh, take. I was just going to look at concealed carry uh, per se. And then as I got into that topic, I realized that it was part of a much broader cultural movement within guns uh, that I stole the, the concept of gun culture 2.0 from Michael Bain uh, with his after the fact blessing. Uh, and so, you know, I've been kind of journeying personally and professionally through the world of gun culture 2.0 for the past 10 years and trying to, to understand it better. Right. And, and when you say gun culture 2.0, because uh, I, I use that term a lot as well um, in my writing and, and when I talk about guns and sort of the way that gun culture has changed over the last several decades. Um, but I, I'd love to hear what you mean by gun culture 2.0. What, what does that term encapsulate for you? Yeah, so for me, gun culture 2.0 is the new version of gun culture, which is centered on armed self-defense. So gun culture 1.0, the preceding culture, really was more centered on hunting and recreational target shooting. And, you know, beginning around the 1960s and certainly into the 70s and 80s, the, the center of mass of gun culture began to shift much more toward uh, self-defense orientation, which it's important to recognize that, of course, self-defense has been part of gun culture from the beginning. Uh, and of course, hunting and recreational shooting continues to be part of gun culture. So we're really talking about where the, the major emphasis of gun culture lies. And there are some things that also kind of revolve around that, which is as the gun culture shifted toward a more defensive orientation, the sort of face of gun culture also shifted. So we see right. uh, self-defense being a more universal concern and interest than hunting and recreation. So, you know, we see uh, that traditional face of gun culture becoming more diverse racially, geographically, ethnically, uh, in terms of gender and sexual orientation. So, you know, I think that's an important analog to uh, that shift toward a defensive orientation. And, you know, I think the third part of that is really uh, changing the nature of shooting and training, you know, so obviously, you know, uh, learning how to hunt, uh, learning how to target shoot, you know, is something that has always been around, but as defense has become more important, then defensive gun training has, has also become more important. Right, right. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think that nails the the definition of it perfectly and obviously i think there's been a lot of emphasis on the latter part of uh the change in demographics right that that gun ownership has gotten younger more and more diverse over the the last uh, several decades here and that we've only seen that really accelerate um in in recent years especially last year uh in 2020 with uh the the surge in new gun owners um and i mean there isn't uh, it's still early, obviously, from especially from an academic point of view, I'm sure. Uh, but what we do know at this point um, is that uh, you know more minority minorities made up a larger percentage of of new gun owners than they had in previous uh, generations, and uh, you know, you saw that in a National Shooting Sports Foundation survey of dealers, um, where the I believe the fastest growing group was uh, was African Americans in, in that survey. And then that was also backed up, I believe, to some degree in a, a University of California study on 
new gun owners in California. Um, <clears throat> yeah, they, and so um, you know, been a Har- little bit of, of uh, insight into this. Yeah, absolutely. Harvard uh, uh, and Northeastern have fielded a new version of their National Firearms Survey, which they did last, I think, in 2015. So in the spring of this year, they polled about 19,000 people and they asked them about their gun buying practices. And if you take uh, for 2020, people who were new gun buyers, about 6.5 percent of all Americans bought a gun uh, last year. This is from Harvard is saying this. So, Mm -hmm. you know, they're not going to overestimate that. Uh, and about 1.5% of new people were new gun owners. So, you know, about a fifth of everybody who bought a gun last year was a new gun owner. And if you just look at that 20%, 50% of those were women, 25% African American, 25% Latino. So those early numbers that the NSSF was getting from uh, gun store owners, you know, is not not necessarily mirrored, but very closely uh, replicated by this uh, more general survey that uh, Harvard and Northeastern mm. have done. I mean, fifty percent of new gun buyers last year were women, and twenty five percent African American, twenty five percent Latino. Those, it's like you said, it's not a new trend; it's an acceleration of an existing trend. But it's pretty remarkable. Yeah, certainly, um, and obviously, it's created a lot of uh, uh, new developments in gun politics uh and uh, certainly that's uh, as what your book is uh in part going to be about uh, i'm sure but um uh and then you've all yeah i think there's also been evidence as well of the first part that you talked about of this shift towards um the priority being on self-defense um although obviously you know like like you mentioned it's not like the other uh, priorities have gone away it's just the the primary focus of gun ownership has has morphed a bit over the years, and I think you've seen this even in uh, Nick's data, uh, the National Instant Criminal Background Check System that the FBI runs, where I believe it was the, for the first time ever um, last year, the Nick's uh, system processed more background checks on handguns over long guns, which mm. uh, indicates obviously uh, <clears throat> a shift towards self defense because people tend to buy handguns for self defense more than they buy long guns for self-defense. Obviously, again, you can use uh, both for either, but um, either self-defense or hunting, but obviously the primary use of handguns is self-defense, and the primary use of a lot of most long guns is uh, hunting or or target shooting um, or sport shooting, things like that. Obviously, you can use both for either one, but but that sort of gives you uh, actual hard data that that backs up this this concept of priority shifting among American gun owners. Yeah. And if you you know, we can break down the data and look in a national survey at people who only own uh, handguns and people who only own handguns, you know, are definitely much more diverse uh, in all the ways we've been talking about than people who own both handguns or long guns or only long Mm -hmm. guns. So, you know, that as as you said, that uh, the shift in emphasis from long guns to handguns in terms of overall purchasing is indicative of gun culture 2.0. Right, certainly. And I think another thing that uh, you can point to in this change in attitudes or the shift in priorities uh, is concealed carry, uh, which has become far more popular over the last several decades. And actually something that you just recently put out uh, a short book on, uh, The Concealed Carry Revolution, which people can buy um, on on Amazon, correct? That yeah, that's right. And uh, this is where you discuss in a pretty pretty concise and easily digestible way the evolution of concealed carry in America from really from the <laughs> before the founding or the founding era at least, mm-hmm. um, and and sort of some of the the philosophical uh, underpinnings of the founding era and, and some of the laws that go back beyond the birth of uh, the United States. Um, all the way up till today and what we've seen in the shift towards permitless carry um, and and how we've moved in uh, sort of evolved nationally uh, over the past several hundred years I guess yeah. really um, although the focus I think starts in the 19th you know the, the 19th century is when you really start to see some of these early uh, gun carry laws um, and and how strict they were compared to 
uh, what we have today. I think you, you start off the book talking uh, about Tombstone and Dodge City, right, and the differences between, you know, the, the time period where the famous uh, shootout at the OK Corral happened and today, where the laws are wildly different. Uh, can you give us a little bit more just about that uh, introduction? Because I think that kind of sums up a lot of uh, what's what's happened, how things have progressed over the last hundred plus yeah. years and, and some of the misconceptions about it. Right. Yeah, and, and just by way of background, you know, this this was not an independent project I had intended to do. When I first started studying concealed carry, I didn't know what the laws were, I didn't know what the history was, and I wanted to find a, a good, reliable, short source that I could turn to to say, you know, what's the status of these laws historically and, and today, and it didn't exist. So I started to write that as a chapter of my bigger book, uh, and it just kind of grew and grew, outgrew that book. The book kind of shifted emphasis, and so I was left with thousands of words, you know, explaining the history, and I thought, well, I'll just put it out in the world. Uh, and so that's the, the background to this book. I should say that uh, I submitted the book to the publisher at the beginning of 2021. And by the time it was actually printed, five more states had gone permitless carry and the Supreme Court had taken the Corlett case. And mm. so, you know, it was out of date by the time that it was released. And so I'm actually putting pushing out an updated version of it. It should be out sometime in the next few weeks that really becomes much more up to date in terms sure, of permitless that, that, carrying correlate. That gives us a, a good um, indication of just how quickly things are evolving on, on uh, in concealed carry across the country. I mean, it's uh, constitutional carry or permitless carry or Vermont carry, or whatever, whatever people prefer to call it. Um, that has really become the, the fastest growing gun policy of the last 20 years. I mean, it wasn't that long ago that the only state that had uh, constitutional carry or permitless carry or Vermont carry was Vermont, uh, right. which has had it since, you know, the founding uh, of, of the country. But uh, then in extremely quick succession after 2010, you now have 21 states uh, as of today that yeah. have this policy. But yeah. Um, but I can, let me answer your question because you, it was a fair yeah, question. You I want to go about. back to the, the yeah. tombstone. So, example. you know, t today, if you look at uh, Kansas and Arizona, they are permitless carry states. I, following a friend, uh, Matthew Carberry, call it Alaska carry is distinct from Vermont carry because these are states that uh, uh, issue permits but don't require permits. Right. Whereas mm. Vermont, you can't even get a permit. So that's actually even a different that's maybe true constitutional carry. Um, you know, so I think, you know, 20 states with Alaska carry plus Vermont, including Kansas and Arizona, which is a dramatic contrast to 19th century Arizona and Kansas, where, uh, you know, it was prohibited to carry a concealed weapon as it was in many states starting in the South and then radiating out from the South. So, you know, we picture, you know, Dodge City and Tombstone as being kind of Wild West places where there are a lot of shootouts and there were a lot of, you know, shootouts, relatively mm -hmm. speaking. Um, but it wasn't, you know, because people were promiscuously toting firearms around, you know, it was for the same reasons we see people shooting each other today. You know, it's not legal concealed carriers. It's people who are uh, sort of engaging in criminal activity. So... Uh, the the shift from from the tombstone in Dodge City of old to permitless carry in tombstone in Dodge City today really represents that entire arc that I try to cover in the book, which is you know the institution of carry bans and then permitting under a may issue system and then permitting under a shall issue system and now perhaps permitless carry being the dominant model, although. You know, I think you've made some good points about how, whether permitless carry has reached its political limit in terms of, uh, you know, being passed in those triple red states, as you call them, uh, stealing your ideas on your own podcast now. But, uh, you know, that's, yeah, it, I mean, I, I think that there's certainly a uh, it's interesting to look at how the policy is, has uh, evolved and how it mirrors 
polarization in the United States. Um, that and uh, I, I, you know, in the, in the piece you're referencing, I also talk uh, about um, red flag laws, right? Because it's it's similar. There, first of all, those are the two most popular state level policies regard you know related to guns over the last decade. Um, in terms of a not what popularity is not. I don't mean by polling. I mean by adoption, mm-hmm. right? Those are the two most quickly adopted policies of the last decade. Uh, and and broadly, but uh, but they're adopted in very different places, right? Uh, you don't have a lot of states that have both of them. Uh, I think there's, in fact, only one. I think Vermont is the only one, and um, you know the this incredible winning streak for constitutional carry advocates over the last decade probably is coming to a close relatively soon. There's still a few states that are triple red, right? That have uh, you know both both bodies of the legislature controlled by Republicans and the governorship. But just look at Louisiana for how hard it is to get uh, constitutional carry passed in a place that doesn't have those things. Um, I think Maine is the only, Maine and Vermont are the only ones where that's happened. And Maine did it when two of the three were red. Um, And now in Louisiana, you got the legislature's completely controlled by Republicans and the governor's a Democrat. He, you know, the legislature passed the bill. The governor vetoed it. The, the, the legislation passed with veto-proof majorities, but when they went to override the veto, uh, as often happens in practice, politics mm-hmm. uh, is, is not generally that simple, um, right. as the math might imply, and so they failed uh, in Louisiana. Now, maybe they'll get it next session. You know, it's hard to say, obviously, exactly how things will go. Maybe the policy uh, will become more popular among um, you know purpler states eventually as you know if there aren't uh, negative consequences from the adoption of the policy which they really uh, I mean ha- haven't seemed to have it, it's it's somewhat ironic because you start the book with the uh, the the comparison to the Wild West right the, the difference in gun laws between tombstone during the okay corral shootout and today and um, the ironic thing is that whenever one of these policies is put up uh, for, for consideration, generally the opposition to them is to say that they'll turn, you know, the state into the Wild West, when ironically the Wild West had much stricter gun laws uh, at the time yeah. than uh, what these proposals are, are pushing. So um, it, it's, it's sort of funny in that way. Uh, and you haven't necessarily, you know, I, I'm not aware of any study that's looked at uh, the, the consequences of cons- uh, constitutional carry being, being enacted in these different states. But, uh, you know, I'm also not aware at all of, you know, exploding crime rates in the immediate aftermath of their adoption. I mean, really, because while they really do is say that so long as you're uh, legally allowed to possess a firearm, so if you're not already prohibited from doing that, then you can carry it and you don't need any, any sort of special permit or training requirements and and we'll talk a little bit about that that part as well because you go over in the book um the differences in training requirements and and so uh i want to talk to you a little bit about that but but uh, you know the policies aren't they usually the kind of crimes that they wipe off the books are generally possession crimes right carrying a gun without a license Mm -hmm. is not a violent crime um now you might get tacked on if you commit a violent crime but uh, you know while you're illegally carrying a gun but um most of the crimes that that go away because of this these kinds of laws are possession crimes so it's hard to um i think it's it's a harder uh ask to prove that those the lack of those possession crimes is directly leads to um violent crimes um and we have you know I, i just am not personally convinced that we've seen an, a big increase in crime in places like Arizona or, or Alaska or right. or Kansas where they've approved these these sorts of policies. But yeah. well, I think at each um, stage of liberalization, you know, whether you go from may issue to shall issue or shall issue to permitless or you know any kind of modification in a shall issue law like North Carolina, uh, you didn't 
originally you couldn't carry uh, in a bar. Now you can carry in a bar. You still can't drink at all, whether you're in the bar or not, while you're carrying. Right. But, you know, at every stage of liberalization, there's been concerns about blood running in the streets because more and more people carrying firearms out in public. Uh, and, you know, I'm with you. I, I haven't seen direct evidence of that. And you know that if someone who is permitless carrying a gun and did something stupid, it would be on the news. You know, the, it's not like that's going to get buried somewhere like, you know, the, the guy you know who shot the kid in uh, the gas station in Florida, right? End up going to jail for murder. But everyone made a big deal because he was a licensed carrier. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we never heard the end of that one. So, um, you know, there have yeah. been some studies that have looked at different states, regimes and crime rates in relation to that. But, you know, they have no way of systematically connect, making a causal connection between more people legally carrying guns and more negative criminal outcomes because of that. And right. because it's hard to causally connect those two things. Right. And, I, you know, I, you, you do see, I think it's every town has a tracker of, uh, I think that their, their title for it is like licensed killers or some, something along those lines where they track um, people with concealed carry licenses who have committed, you know, violent crimes. And I think that they focus a lot on the anecdotal, obviously, because the, the data we do have, and some states put out um, the their data on you know how many people with concealed carry licenses commit crimes florida does it texas uh, does it um obviously texas just went to permitless carry so you know maybe they maybe the, that'll change in the future but although they're keeping their their current permitting system as well so um presumably people will still have permits because permits give you the reason that you know you made that distinction with alaska and vermont before the reason that a lot of these states keep their uh, permitting systems when they go to a permitless uh, uh, law is so that people can carry in other states because most states will require you to have a, a permit that they recognize in order to carry if you're not a resident. Yep. Um, and, and so that's why a lot of these states still keep their, their old permit systems when they uh, go to permitless. But uh, that aside, <laughs> um, you, you see in the data that people who have these permits are tend to actually be the least um, likely to commit crimes, even less so than police officers. So um, the data we do have suggests that these the people who are uh, willing to go out and get a permit to go through the process um, are very law abiding. Mm -hmm. Generally speaking, obviously you will, that doesn't mean that, you know, the best person, just because you have a history of, you know, being law abiding doesn't mean that you're always going to see that everyone will never commit a crime after that point. Of course, that's uh, that go, would go against human nature. But, but generally speaking, um, the data shows that people who get permits to carry guns are are really the uh, least likely to become violent criminals themselves. So. And even if, uh, you know, that's a, there's the counterfactual, right, that that, that uh, violence policy center work assumes that if the person didn't have the permit, that they wouldn't have ended up killing somebody. Right. right? It's like, you know, so so uh, it's not exactly a, a controlled scientific methodology. Yeah. And I, I think that, too, the a lot of focus on permitless carry, get, like permitless carry is for people who have permits to carry, like to make their lives less uh, difficult, but really permitless carry again, like the person it actually affects are the people who never got a permit, who are carrying a gun illegally, um, most likely because they are at least in some circumstances because they didn't understand what the rules were, which is frankly, as somebody who is a certified firearms instructor in Virginia and can teach the the course which we can get we'll get into uh, just a moment here about the training aspect of all this but I know a lot of people who don't understand completely the rules when they own hand this is why I tell everyone in Virginia that I know who owns a handgun that you ought to get the permit to carry even if you don't actually ever want to carry a gun on your person 
Um, you don't want to get a holster and put it on your body and carry it around because the problem is that you don't have to be, so you don't have to have a gun holstered on you to break the concealed carry laws in, in Virginia. It's not, it, it, there's, there's a lot more that goes into it than that. Like you can, if you just transport your gun incorrectly, um, that can be a huge problem. I mean, there was actually, uh, um, the case of, uh, there was a black, uh, soldier in, in Virginia. This is a famous, uh, uh viral case where he got pulled over and, and pep, uh, t what does he get? Um, the police, uh, wanted him to get out of the car and there was confrontation and they tased him. Um, he was in uniform. And one of the things that people used to justify that was that he had a gun in the car. Now it turned out later that he had a permit anyway, but, uh, there was some, you know, there was all this second guessing based on the concept that he just had a gun in his car, in like a compartment in his car. Uh, because, well, in Virginia, you know, there was a attorney general ruling from 2010 that said you can have a, a loaded gun in, in a, your center console or in a compartment in the car without violating the state's carry law, you know, carry laws. But you can't, if it was in an open container, like in a, in a just a pocket next to his door or the, uh, you know, the little area in the door on most cars that if you had it in there, that would be illegal. You know, there, there's a lot of things where th there's technicalities mm -hmm. that go into whether or not you're committing a felony or doing something perfectly legal that a lot of people just don't even understand. And, you know, the, the, this is one of the issues that a lot of people have with um, permit systems is that they uh, can make somebody who has done nothing else wrong uh, a, a felon over something that uh, is to a lot of people would be a technicality, a possession technicality. Yeah. And so and here, uh, I think you know, that, that's how I look at it with, with these sorts of laws personally, because I, like, I don't see that they've driven up crimes um, in any noticeable way across the states that have adopted them. And really, they do more to protect people who just don't understand that they're even breaking the law than they do to uh, anything else. I, like a, a lot of a lot of these kind of crimes, these possession crimes, are used as like ways to try and get at criminals who you can't get because you don't have the evidence that they've committed more serious crimes. Yeah, and to uh, I mean that, to your point, like there's uh, there was a study that came out of Loyola, Chicago, recently looking at. Uh, gun crimes in Cook County, and you know, they found a, an extremely high percentage of all the the gun crimes that were um, were prosecuted in Cook County were possession crimes, illegal possession crimes. And so the person who I saw tweeting about it was kind of saying like, well, you know, permitless carry in Illinois, and this guy is definitely not pro-gun at all, but he's saying like permitless carry could create some more racial equity in the criminal justice system because, you know, of those 75 percent of, of illegal carry cases in Cook County, a huge percentage of them were African-Americans. Yep. Um, now, you know, obviously some of them were probably not uh, they were prohibited persons or underage or something. So they you know would have been convicted even under permitless carry. Sure. But for those people who want to carry a gun but can't go through the process to get an Illinois permit, which, as I say in my book, is one of the most stringent systems, you know, that mm -hmm. you have 16 hours of class, four hours on the range. If you live in the city of Chicago, you, there's no range in the city of Chicago for you to to take that part of the course. I mean, it's a huge burden on people to carry under even a shall issue regime, right? So we say sh shall issue like, you know, that's great. And compared to may issue, it is great. But there are still many financial and practical hurdles that are put in people's way to get a, a permit in some shall. I mean, some shall issue states are very easy, but there's the devil is in the details, you know? Yeah. And that's certainly the exact same thing in, in Washington, D.C. as well, right across the river from where I live, uh, where it's the same same idea, the extremely high bar for what training is required. And obviously some people, you know, this is a controversial topic to, um, because, because certainly the ideal is that you should not carry a gun if you are not trained to carry a gun. I think everyone would agree with that, um, that you have a responsibility 
to get trained if you want to carry a firearm on your person where you go or if you want to handle a firearm at all, frankly. But you should take an extra level of, of training if you want to carry it around in public. But <clears throat> the problem is when people uh, use that or politicians use that concept that responsibility and turn it into something that makes it effectively impossible for most people to actually uh, obtain the necessary training for a permit and then they're uh, stripped of that right effectively or stripped of their ability to because uh, you talk about rights versus uh, you know uh, permits mm -hmm. and and um, I think that's an interesting you know debate obviously that whether or not Carrying a gun in public is a right. Um, certainly, I personally believe the Second Amendment covers that, but but there's plenty of people who, who don't uh, believe that. Um, even other gun owners necessarily uh, right. don't necessarily believe that. But um, you know, when you, especially in places like Chicago and D.C., like when you do that, it, you're going to have disproportionate impact on minorities because that's where a lot of minorities live um uh, you know and it's the same odd thing that always comes up with guns and race um i think when you, when you discuss gun laws and race because oftentimes the people who are concerned about disproportionate impact um and how that's a sign of racism uh they they just don't talk about all of the disproportionate impact that gun laws have and have had historically and especially since a lot of gun control laws came explicitly from racist motivations like they they were created explicitly to restrict the rights of minorities especially african americans in the united states so obviously um not everyone who supports gun control laws today are racists um I, you know i wouldn't make that argument but there's sort of this missing component when we talk about uh, the effect of, of gun laws, uh, effect of laws generally on and how some of them have a disproportionate impact on certain communities. And that uh, means there's a systemic problem, right? This is a common argument you hear about a lot of kinds of laws, but that doesn't really, um, at least not uh, at the same level from the same people get applied to gun laws. Mm -hmm. This um, is, you know, the person I was to, you know debating or talking to on twitter was experiencing a very profound uh, sort of division because he recognized that permitless carry could would ha would very likely have a positive effect on racial inequality uh, at the same time he was did not want permitless carry he didn't doesn't like the idea of people carrying guns around and so he's trying to figure out you know how do how do i manage that sort of uh distinction or that division and you know i think that a lot of people when the bronx defenders uh, filed the amicus brief in the in the corlett case mm -hmm. you know and you know people were like who who are these people these public defenders who represent um, you know uh, poor racial minority clients arguing that people should have a right to carry guns people have a really hard time getting their minds around that but it's worth yeah. you know thinking about and pondering and there's a lot there's a lot of nuance here too because obviously uh, polling indicates that most African Americans are not supportive of of liberalizing gun laws or that that they tend to support more gun control. So, you know, it's not it's not as as simple as I think a lot of people like to make it out to be. But but clearly there's a conversation that's not generally had about this uh, that really baffles me personally as to. Uh, you know the the intellectual rigor of some of these people that like just ignore the, the these facts. I mean, you can there's there's all sorts of uh, data that that shows this, and we have a long history of uh, racial you know racist use of gun control mm -hmm. laws that go back to, to the founding era, um, mm -hmm. and, and so it's I just think it's something that deserves a lot more attention and discussion because yeah, like a lot of these gun laws. One, they get used um, against people who haven't done anything other than have a gun in the wrong, under the wrong circumstances. Um, maybe that's appropriate if you've got a history that, uh, you know, like a violent felony, something along those lines, uh, 
you know, you've been adjudicated mentally. There's some, there's some uh, due process that you've gone through that shows that you're uh, not, not society deems that you're not eligible based on what your actual personal actions have been to own firearms. That that's one thing, you know, there's obviously debate there about violent felonies versus nonviolent felonies, of course, too. But um, a lot of times it's just, you had a gun and you carried it the wrong way. Uh, you transported it the wrong way and that got you arrested and um, changed your life forever. Uh, and it's, it's, it's like used as a sort of shortcut to get at what police think are bad people. Uh, we can't prove that this person did the violent thing, but we can prove that they transported a gun the wrong way. Right. So... Yeah, and I, I was just on a, a race and guns panel with uh, Nicholas Johnson, the Fordham law professor, who's written about uh, the black tradition of arms, as he says. And he brings up this issue that you do, which is, you know, how do you, how does that the the tradition of black arms uh, interface with what he calls the modern orthodoxy today, which is a sort of strong pro gun control stance that African Americans take, um, and you know probably for understandable reasons, given the amount of violence that uh, people in uh, African-American communities are subjected to. And uh, so yeah, he, sure. he might be an interesting guest for you to, to really engage that issue since he knows the, the history of, uh, of the, the bad uses to which uh, gun control laws have been put and, you know, is a really mm -hmm. sort of staunch advocate for, you know, African-American gun ownership. Yeah, and I mean, I've, I've heard... Um african-american gun owners explain uh some of the the uh, uh some of what's at play here with why why that that sort of attitude exists which oftentimes i think boils down to um that in, in certain communities obviously i mean it, it's hard to talk about african-americans as because uh, i don't want to i don't want to like you, you can't generalize too much this is like any other group of people like they aren't all the same obviously uh, they're not a monolith, right? It's not, you can't just say that all black people had this experience or all black people think this thing. That's not, it's not true, obviously. Um, but um, for at least some, what I've heard from people like Madge Ture, um, who's a, a black gun rights advocate, um, <clears throat> and a number of other uh, others, they've said, you know, in, in some communities that experience high violence uh, levels, uh, some African American communities, inner city communities, guns come to uh, be used by either the police or the criminals and there aren't really positive associations with either of those th groups so people tend to uh, look at guns through that prism uh, in some of these communities uh, but uh, obviously I don't want to speak too much uh, for any of a black person because I don't I haven't lived that experience I don't know I'd obviously we had Tiffany Johnson on the podcast a couple weeks ago and I plan to have more um, African-American gun owners, Asian-American, all sorts of different people, because one of the things that I want to do with this podcast, and this is where I think that what you're, you're doing with academia or in academia and, and gun scholarship um, is sort of similar, is I want to try and, and look at uh, stories and groups of people that don't get a lot of attention inside of the gun owning community. Um, uh, you know, I want to bring people on who have interesting stories that are different from my own um, and, and different from what maybe some of my listeners have experienced. And I want to tell stories that aren't told in most of the rest of the media, because most of the media focuses on almost exclusively the criminal use of firearms, right? That, that's really all you get in terms of coverage outside of a few uh, standout examples like this uh it's Time Magazine mm -hmm. um, issue that I was part of a couple years ago. That you know, for those watching on YouTube, you can see that's what that's why there's a Time Magazine uh, poster on my uh, the backdrop here. I'm actually on this cover because they looked at you know several hundred people and their experience with the firearms on both sides of the political issue of guns. But I, you know, I just think that there's not much coverage of. You know, things like the gun makers match that I went and covered for, you know, early on with the reload, um, uh, the Asian American Gun Owners uh, Association or Asian Asian American Pacific Islander Gun Owners, uh, AAPI Go, you know, that group forming or, or uh, the Guns Out guys, 
um, the two African American hosts of a, a, a show. Uh, they started up a, a show about guns, uh, and they've had a lot of success with it. And I've <clears throat> profiled them, but there's you know there's all these stories of people and different groups, uh, the Liberal Gun Clubs, another one um, that you that that just don't get told out elsewhere and get kind of ignored in favor of just talking about really basically just mass shootings is the only topic that you ever really hear about in when it comes with, to guns and in, in media. So. Uh, they, you know, that that's what I try to focus on with the reload and with this podcast and sort of expanding the universe of stories about firearms in America. Um, and I, you know, I know that's something that you've also uh, faced with gun scholarship is that it's sort of limited to one particular avenue and you, you've tried to take a more broad approach. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah. So, you know, I, I grew up in uh, a political and cultural blue bubble in the San Francisco Bay Area. So I never saw, touched or fired a gun until I was 42 years old living in North Carolina uh, and, you know, moving from that blue bubble into academia, which is an even bluer bubble. And then within academia, sociology is an even bluer, like the, we're talking the pure, pure blue. Blue is not even blue enough. Um, you know, that that I understand the default position, which is I have no experience with guns. And so what do I know about guns? I know what I see in the media, which is that guns do bad things. So, you know, I sort of bring that baggage with me into North Carolina where I start talking to people and it seems that I'm the only person who doesn't have a gun. Like guys I play tennis with, my fantasy football league, you know, IT guys, doctors, like everybody's got a gun, not just, you know, kind of rednecks like driving their trucks around in, in the countryside. Um, and so I, when I started studying guns academically, I thought, well, guns are really normal for these people. This is a normal part of life for lots of different types of people, men, women, races, whatever, social class. Um, and so I start getting into the academic literature and I realized that nobody writes about the normality of guns. Everybody writes about the criminal use of guns and gun injury and death, basically epidemiology. Uh, and, you know, so that that uh, bias that you see reflected in the media is also reflected in the way that academics have approached guns historically. And so, you know, I've been fighting a small, you know, lonely battle to try to emphasize ways in which guns, as I say, guns are normal and normal people use guns. That's that's my gun culture 2.0 motto. Mm -hmm. uh, and and it's, you know, not easy to to study that in the sense that in the same way that, hey, man carries gun, nobody gets shot. That's not really a news story. Right. You know, that's not really an academic story either, in a sense. Uh, and so, you know, I've had to work work hard to to try to unearth those aspects of normality which are worthy of further scholarly attention uh, and so you know that's been been part of my my project and uh, you know I have enough credibility I think I mean maybe people bash me behind my back but you know I have enough credibility and uh, you know I publish peer-reviewed research I edited a special issue of a journal recently you know and so People, people have to take those ideas seriously, even if it's kind of working around the margins of what people are still largely interested in, which is criminology and epidemiology. Sure, sure. And uh, once again, author of Concealed Carry Revolution. I, I really recommend this because it's it's very uh, succinct, you know, and it's well sourced. And it really does a good job of explaining how we went from basically total bans on concealed carry to basically total bans on concealed carry permits so that you can uh, carry a gun without uh, any sort of a, uh, government uh, papers. But uh, I think it does a really good job of explaining that history and, and doing it concisely. Um, and once again, where can people pick this up? So uh, the, I'm working on the updated edition. This, this uh, first edition is available on Amazon. The publisher I was working with ended up n kind of screwing things up and never got a Kindle edition into Amazon. So this is another reason to, to do the updated edition. 
-hmm. So within a couple of weeks, the updated edition will be available in print and uh, electronic edition within Amazon. Oh, wonderful. Well, I will look forward to picking up that copy so I can see what you have to say about, uh, well, tech. I mean, Texas is a big deal. That's the biggest state to do permitless carry thus far. And the, of course, the Supreme Court has taken up a case against New York's gun carry law, their May issue law. Um, and so that's obviously a huge deal in, in this topic. So I think the updated version will be really interesting. I think the regular version is still great um, <clears throat> for those who want to read it immediately, but I will absolutely look out for the updated version. And I just wanted to thank you for coming on. I know you have a class as well that you teach and, and that you uh, bring your students out to learn, uh, uh, you know, practically about firearms as well. I think maybe we can have you back on uh, the next time you're, you're done with that class, uh, just to talk a little bit more about your, your methods and, and your research and, and how you teach uh, about guns, because I think it's probably a bit different from from how a lot of other professors do it. So we'll have to have you on again uh, once that happens. But I uh, really appreciate you coming on. Uh, I think you gave us some really uh, insightful uh, uh, information there. And uh, I would encourage people to follow you. Where, where else can they find your work besides this book? Yeah, so uh, I basically have two blogs. I have um, Gun Culture 2.0. If you just Google it, uh, you should find my blog there. I've been doing that for eight or nine years now. Uh, it got to be a little bit sort of um, maybe more targeted towards people who are already into guns. So I started a second blog called Gun Curious, which was kind of designed for people who were trying to find more good neutral information about guns. And so if you Google Gun Curious, you should find that blog and you can actually read about uh, the class that I'm teaching on there. I've posted all the modules, the syllabus, and I talk about our gun field trip, but I'd love to come back on uh, on the podcast to talk more about about how that class works yeah absolutely well we'd love to have you on again uh again we really appreciate you taking the time to talk with us and uh we will see you again soon thank you thanks and that's all we've got this week on the weekly reload podcast thank you for joining us again if you want this podcast a day early this is the only this is the only advertisement we do on the show right now so Please bear with me. I hope it's not too annoying. But please go ahead over to the reload.com. Join today. You'll get the podcast early. You'll get access to all kinds of exclusive posts that aren't available for free to everyone else, uh, including, again, the analysis on why there's been media silence on our latest Chipman exclusive breaking story, um, despite the clear newsworthy nature of it. But that's all we've got now. Uh, I'll see you guys again real soon. Thank you. I made the devil run. I gave him poison just for fun. I had one friend, now there's none. I made the devil run. I broke so many bones. But none of them were ever mine.